Hi there, this is Danny Beaumont. We are just getting started with this week's Adobe Muse Jam Session. Welcome to Jam Session Recording 198. Topic this week is going to be all about how did you do that, basically. Um, one of my favorite sessions. We're going to focus on how you go about building some of the techniques that we see in the Adobe Muse side of the day. I'm going to do a quick check on technology here. See if things are working the way they should. I'm a one man show and one woman show. All right, we're going to assume we're in good shape. Okay. And uh, what I want to do is begin by going to a particular location. Let's see if I can get this to behave a little bit. All right, great. I'm going to go on into the Adobe Muse microsite. So that's at muse.adobe.com. This is a great place to hang out if you're new to Muse and want to see things that the team are involved in. Uh, I spend a lot of time here. Um, a couple of areas that are really terrific. The events tab will cover over here. Let's get this guy where I want it to be. So the events tab will cover over any topics that we have coming up so that you know to attend them, either by way of Facebook Live. Um, we also have a YouTube channel with many recordings that we've done in the past, and you can watch those past recordings here in the events area. Site of the day is a terrific place to hang out. This is where the team selects a few sites each week to showcase. And the focus of today's session is going to be really looking at how some of these implementations have taken place. Whenever we do this session, I ask folks in the community to submit designs that they like or techniques that they're not sure about. I heard from a few of you this year, uh, this week, so we're going to go ahead and take a look at those um, from some of the more recent submissions. So to be clear, Site of the Day is not necessarily the most beautiful websites you've ever seen because it's a showcase for Adobe Muse. It's really examples of interesting implementations around the feature set within Muse within a site. And the three sites that I have on deck to showcase today are good examples of that. Again, some of them are amazingly beautiful. Some are um, just really wonderfully functional and have techniques that I think we can all learn from. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over. At, if you're watching me on Facebook Live, I encourage you to go ahead and put your comments in the comment field of the live session. I will stop and see if I can jump over and take a look at those questions um, as I take breaks. But we'll see how that goes. Okay. All right. Beginning with that agenda. For site of the day, I have a few different sites that I want to focus on. One uh, is from a fellow by the name of Frank Kampf. So when you submit site of the day, there is a checkbox there that says that you give us permission to learn from you as well. So it's kind of a, perhaps a double-edged sword. Um, we get to showcase your work, but we also get to teach folks in the community how it is that you took the approach that you did when you do submit your source file. So I'm hugely appreciative of that. It allows me to learn a ton. That's why we call this a jam session. We both learn from each other um, as I examine work that people in the community submit to us. So this first example, Press the Web, uh, I tend to like it because I'm a huge fan also of letterpress and typography. And this is kind of old meets new to some extent. Let's see if I've got this guy open still. Looks like I need to open it once again. So let me grab that URL. And I'll go ahead and push it here. So this is a German website. It may load a little more slowly. I am in the States. It's probably hosted on a um, hosting platform in Europe. Um, we'll see how that load time goes. There's a number of things about this site that I think are pretty terrific. Um, notice, I'm just going to talk out loud a little bit. Um, it's some of the criteria that I use as I evaluate site of the day. Uh, I also have opinions of approaches that are taken here. I might even um, give a little feedback about how I would perhaps do it a little differently. Um, this is a terrific site. It's got a landing page, which is where we are right now. It's got some call to actions here on the left-hand side. So I could jump directly to the gallery 
Um, I could also go directly to Facebook, which takes me outside the app. Notice that there's a home icon here on the right hand side, and we've got navigation up towards the top. I've got the um, name of the site, press the letter here on the left. And if I press and drag the edge of the browser, I can pretty well tell this is likely a fluid breakpoint website. So as I come along here, objects within the container, it's kind of exaggerated. Um, you'll see that images are scaling here at the bottom, the thumbnails that are there. That's a good indication that it's a fluid breakpoint and not fixed. There is uh, a nice approach going on here where we have a slideshow up towards the top in the hero area, as we tend to call it. As I scroll down, you'll notice that although this is a fluid breakpoint site, I get this nice background image. Now, the background image does not have parallax scrolling applied. It's just a, a static image that's there, but it gives a nice depth of, uh, feel to the site. And you can see here towards the bottom that that background image remains throughout the page um, by way of defining that background. I am going to take a quick pause and check my technology. Something tells me we're a little funny on some bits here. So bear with me for one second. Okay. I'm going to check my audio real quickly. Still a bit of a skeptic. There's a couple things that usually happen when I'm presenting and I'm not seeing them. Okay. And let me check Facebook real quick, folks. All right, we're there. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to keep going. <sighs> Good thing you guys are patient. Uh, so here we've got the, as we mentioned, there's a slideshow playing in the hero area up, up, up towards the top. And you'll notice I've got navigation here. Um, I can jump between those hero images. We'll take a look at how that's built. As I scroll down, I've got some nice thumbnails and there's a nice effect that's applied here. It's a hover effect. As I roll over the image, I'm not positive if this is using a widget or if it's a native um, hover effect. I'll show you how you can do this natively. Um, I think that folks don't always know how you can achieve that. As I come towards the bottom of the page, notice I've got a two column structure here. A couple things to keep in mind. Um, these objects, see how they're moving towards the center? It's a nice approach depending on your design. You'll notice that the distance between the icons here is minimizing, um, but not the distance between these objects here. We'll take a look at how he achieved that. When I get to a certain point where my design is about to break, or Frank's design is about to break, let's say, um, I jump to another break point where, again, I have a little bit more room. He's using a bit of a different approach here. Again, I'm, we're just going to dissect. I think this is fun to do, um, at least to me. Notice that in the larger breakpoint, the distance between these two icons is minimizing. When I get to that second breakpoint, uh, it's more of a fluid breakpoint where the distance between these objects is minimizing, but not so much the distance in the center. So that's just some pinning decisions that he's made as he's working. As we get even closer down, things get a little overlappy. It's a little tough right there. It's hard to adjust all of these um, as you go, but it needs a little bit more room there, and it might be the pinning decisions that he's made. As I come down on the page, notice I've got a nice grid structure here. So if I press and drag out, the grid, it's a lot of, I think there's a lot of merit in pointing some of these things out. As I mentioned, I'm here by myself, so uh, I can go on as much as I like. Notice the images here in this layout. So they are all of a fixed height. Notice they're all the same height, and they have a certain width. 
as I press and drag them, notice what's happening. The image height is not changing, but the image width is changing. That's because they have been set as fluid width images. So this is a design decision you can make. You may decide that trimming the sides of an image is not acceptable. It works really well with this tile design structure, but it also can, depending on the image that you're working with, it can cause you trouble. Uh, I think it, the design works really well for this layout. I'll get to a certain point where those tiles in their fluid width behavior are getting a little too narrow, and that's when I jump to the next breakpoint. Again, that same methodology there as it's working. Fluid width, once again there as well. Okay. Let's kind of keep going. Um, each of these have a light box. So if I click in on them, notice what happens. So this is really important again as well. When you build out a site in Muse, you could choose, let's go back here just for a second. I'm going to hit the close box. It's a really nice behavior that he's applied here. So as I come down on the page, there's a series of tiles, right? You might say, hey, Danny, why don't I just use a light box widget on this page? Um, and I'm going to jump back and make sure I'm right. Um, talking to myself. Um, what Frank has done here is he's got a series of thumbnails. When I click on the thumbnail, if you look down towards the bottom in this area here, notice that it's not a trigger target. It's not um, a composition widget with a thumbnail that opens up a light box. Instead, what it is, is I've got a thumbnail. It has a hover effect, which is great. So the roll over effect is probably a a glow that's been applied, we're gonna check that, but it's going to another page in the website. This is important, when you're building out a site, if you build out, let's say nine tiles for a gallery, those nine tiles, if you have them in a light box on the page, it can get a bit heavy if we're talking about graphic rich images. A nice way to offset the load time for your landing page is to have each of your thumbnails actually link to another page in the site. So Frank was really smart about this. When I go in and click on that individual thumbnail, it's going to another page, but it has that light box appeal. The way he's done it is he's got a closed box here, right? Makes you feel like you're in a light box behavior. Notice I can scroll down and the text moves. I'm not positive why that happens. I probably would have pinned the text so that it stayed in a fixed position, but see how it's got a nice fluid breakpoint it resizes to adjust to the width of the browser. That background image stays there. And that image is tiling through variations of the image. So it looks like there's a slideshow applied to this page. It's a full screen slideshow and it's set for horizontal swipe. All right, I'm gonna do a technical check again. Just make sure folks are doing good. Looks like we got a few comments on this. So your job is to all right, good. Sylvester, Jamil, Babis, Aziz, excellent to hear from you. Great to know that everything's going well. I'm gonna keep talking to myself, so let's continue. If you have questions, throw them in the chat. Um, I appreciate it. All right, so we're gonna keep going. Um, I, I am curious to see a little bit about this layout here as well. Here's the tricky fun part. Looks like it's a light box, right? The behavior is like a light box. When I, closed, <laughs> when I click the close box, Notice what happens. Again, I'm kind of giving you um, all of the cheats on Frank's beautiful site here. Look down here towards the bottom. When I hover over that close box, the URL is going to take me back to the home page. Very, very clever. So if I do that, it takes me back to the home page where I'm free to then come in and click on another uh, deep dive detail page for the site. Notice it's a different URL. I see it here in the header. Again, I have a description and I have a background slideshow that's playing. Enough suspense, let's go on in and take a look at Frank's site here. So here I am in Adobe Muse. Um, we've got press the letter. Uh, first things that I notice is he's got a few different master pages. So I kind of want to examine what he's got going on there. I think when you look up here towards the top, you can see which masters are in use. And let's go ahead and make this a bit bigger so that we can see a little bit more about the layout. So he's got home master in use. He's also got interior masters. Um, as I scroll along, 
Notice that he's got another master for the detailed pages. This is how he's simulating that light box like behavior. So if I go to the first master, the home master, and just kind of zoom out on it a little bit, pretty vanilla, not a lot of widgets, no widgets at all um, from third parties on this page. I've just got the layout. He's got a gray background fill. He's got footer content, some social media content, top level nav. He's got the home button here. This is kind of a nitpick probably of mine. That home button, it's not that big. Um, and the breakpoint is not that great. I honestly, not that Frank asked, <laughs> but I would honestly set this to be a resize of none. There's no real need to have to scale the icon necessarily, just kind of my opinion. <laughs> You'll notice I don't design anything. I just critique other people's designs. Keep that in mind while I sip my coffee. Okay, so we got the top level nav there. If I jump to the next breakpoint, that was a fluid breakpoint. I see 768 about the class of devices where you're getting into tablet devices. And in that, I've got what's known as a hamburger menu, although this is probably, when it doesn't look like a hamburger, um, this looks more like, oh, I don't know, something German. Um, I've got an indicator that there's a menu here. Notice when I click on it, it's just a simple accordion. That accordion is set to full browser width, so stretch to browser width. That's going to assure that it will span the width of the browser. When I click in on that accordion and expand it, it drops down, and I've got a simple navigation. If I click in on that, very simple. He's got um, actually just text boxes. So rather than using a dynamic menu, Frank used individual text fields. I can click into any one of those. I could change it, um, change the words to anything I want. Um, he could have used a manual menu, but if we look at his site plan, he has a lot of pages up there at the top nav. So um, a dynamic menu would be a little harder to deal with than just what he's done, just text boxes. Um, I'm gonna also take a peek at his states here. So we'll bring the states panel open. And I could see he's got some, actually, very subtle rollovers. There's just a really subtle gray for the rollover states. Pretty terrific. But notice how he's configured this accordion menu. If I click it to expand it, click it to hide it, when I go to the blue flyout panel, notice that it's set to expand behavior is set to close all. That's number one. Number two, it's set to overlap items below. That is the trick to get a push menu from the top or in fact, the bottom of your website. A lot of folks don't know that if he were to have placed this accordion at the bottom of the page and pin it to the bottom of the page using browser level pinning, it'll have that same push behavior, but it would have the navigation persistent at the bottom of the page. You click it and it pushes back up to the top. So he's got a nice push behavior. If we go back to the live site and go ahead and drag in to see how that little icons getting smaller. I know it's my nitpick. Um, keep dragging until I get to that smaller breakpoint. There we go. And when I click it, it's got a couple things going on. So there's a slideshow that's here. The slideshow is not pushing, but the page content is. So we kind of have to look at that a little bit um, more specifically. This may be a full screen slideshow. Yeah. It's interesting. I'm, in, I'm curious why it's not pushing the slideshow down. He may have done that by design. Um, and it's probably using a third-party widget there. Uh, but good stuff going on. I'm going to jump over back into the layout. And let's just keep going. We're going to go to the next break point, which is more for mobile devices, like a, a phone, I would say, smartphone device. Again, he's got that same push menu. Um, and his navigation towards the bottom has changed a bit here just to accommodate the narrower layout. We'll go back to the site plan, and he's got an interior master. It may just be that there are color changes here. I'm not positive, but it's got a darker layout. If I go back to those masters, notice that there's no inheritance here. So depending on what you're doing, if the difference between the home master and the interior master is really just the background color, you can play with having all of the design elements on that main master 
create an interior master that has a different background fill but inherits these elements. The reason why I would mention that is every time you duplicate an element within Muse, mentally you just have to remember you've done that. So uh, if, for example, Frank wanted to come in and change, for example, the way, <laughs> I know, I'm like, uh, I don't know, when they say don't stare at the cones, I'm the one that stares at the cones on a motorcycle. Um, for example, if he wanted to change the way this icon behaves, he has to remember because he duplicated all of the elements on the interior master that were on the home master that he would need to come in and change that in both instances, right? Another approach might be to play with what the differences are between the two layouts and try to have one common master that shared all the elements rather than duplicating them, if that made sense. But I have that nice dark master. And then here's his really wonderful trick for giving you that feeling of uh, a slideshow when it's really separate pages to offset the load time of his pages. So he's got a nice close box here, right? Tricky. It's just a basic element. It's a rectangle with two lines. He could add states to this if he wanted, just to indicate that it is a click button. There aren't any states there. Frank, I love your site, by the way. I'm not picking on you. Um, and uh, he's also put these sidebars here. I think that helps to achieve this idea of a light box. When you think about it, a light box usually has, it'll dim things out behind it. So it's kind of a nice lightweight way for him to simulate that light box. When that close box occurs, notice that it just simply links back to the home page, I think. My German is non-existent, so um, I believe that that just takes him back home. And uh, what was my other thought for a moment? Notice he doesn't even have any breakpoints on this page. Because it is a light box behavior and he wants to have that right bar with all the text, he can overlay that easily. No need to have breakpoints. You only add breakpoints when your design breaks. And um, he has not done that. Let's go back out to the master again. Notice that it has no master I either. So there's no header, no footer, no other navigation on these pages because he is trying to simulate dimming out the site and popping up a light box. Let's go on into the detailed pages. I'll double click on the home page and take a quick look around. I can see he's got quite a few breakpoints and they're fluid breakpoints. So notice he's got 1200, 960. The 960 aligns with the tablet-like breakpoints. Looks like he's also got a breakpoint on the master for phone. Yeah, he's got quite a few breakpoints. So in general, when you're designing a master page, you do want to make sure that you have the right navigation elements on your master. Let's jump back there for a moment. I'll come into the home master. He's got quite a few master um, breakpoints. And if we kind of sort of judge real quickly what's happening across those breakpoints. I kind of want to take a glance. If you've worked in Muse, you know that you, I, I have a few beliefs. One is pencil out your entire design, pencil out every element on paper before you begin to execute it in Muse. Begin with the largest breakpoint in Muse and really decide when you really need to add another breakpoint. The reason being is that content can shift a lot. It gets complicated when you do add multiple breakpoints on a page, and you just want to know that the effort necessary to keep all your content in place is really justified. So if I jump from 960 to 768 for a moment, I notice that there's a nav change here. So that makes sense that we have a breakpoint there. If I jump down again, so I've just got the three breakpoints for my main master. Let's go ahead and jump over to the interior master and see there. I've got 960, 768, and 480. So if I go out now to the individual page again, let's go back to his landing page. Interestingly enough, he's got a larger breakpoint than he does on the master. I'm not sure why he made that design decision. Um, kind of interesting to me. Usually you would have. Yeah, I don't know. This is why I learn. But um, usually you would have that larger breakpoint in your master also. All right. 
Frank, reach out. You have to teach me a couple things in person. So as I continued down, Hi guys, I had a little bit of a network issue, I think, but we're back. I'm going to continue. Okay. So we were here on our master page. Zoom out a little bit. Um, let's zoom back in again. Did I mention we have a new beta coming out and that I highly encourage you to come by and play? We're going to drop something tomorrow that's really playful. A couple features that are pretty amazing, having to do with responsive widgets and some real productivity features. So come on into the private beta. Go to museprerelease.com. You have to agree to keep it secret and not talk about it publicly until we're ready to launch. But uh, I encourage you to come check it out. There's definitely one feature that I've gotten used to using that I can't use right here around zooming in and out of my pages. I'll stop talking about that now. Um, so here I am on that master page. And notice there's a browser fill that's here. If I come into, let's see, this guy. When I come in to look at the master here, so with nothing selected on that canvas, in the browser fill area, I have this guy. And notice when I go to the drop down, there is a browser fill color that's selected. And that's that background fill. So if I come on over here and check into, let's just see, the live site. Remember how I mentioned we have this background image and it stays towards the bottom. That's achieved by way of a browser fill. I'm going to come back over here and uh, look a little further down the page. So as we progress, we have those nice thumbnails. So as I mentioned, there's a few hypotheses I have here. One is if I click once, I've got a group, that's all, it's just a group of objects. Click a second time, I have just an image frame, so it's a placed image. Notice if I open up the states panel, the roll over state, it's kind of hard because this is in the way, but I roll over, see how it's got just that nice glow. The way he achieved that is normal has nothing applied. Roll over in the effects drop down. If I switch over to glow, he applied a glow with a glow color and an opacity of 40% um, and a blur of 200. So it gives that nice roll over feeling. It lets you know it's a clickable area. And clicking on it, takes you to an individual page. So see how he's got that workshop page here in the site. So pretty simple. Again, this allows him to offset the load as he's jumping over. I'm gonna go back into the master and uh, take a look at that workshop page. So I'll double click there. Now he is using some, some third party widgets that are worth mentioning. One is from J26. It allows you to make sure that your search engine um, tagging is as good as it can be. I'm going to check a little operationally here. Check on Zoom. All right, I'm going to keep going. Things are funny today. I'm not sure. You'll notice I'm not in the office. And perhaps my network is suffering a little bit because of that. We'll close this out in just a few minutes. I want to kind of close this guy out. So uh, in that workshop page, he does have a third-party widget, and it's called InfiniScroll. That's from Muse Themes. And it gives you, if you look at the live site on the workshop page, notice he's got this infinite scrolling behavior. He has a beautiful, um, probably panoramic, very long and thin image that he gets to show off there. From there, he's got a two column structure that if I press and drag, notice it's got fluid breakpoints. As I come down on the page, he actually took screenshots of these. These are images 
And the advantage there is that he's got a lot of complexity there. It's going to scale both height and width. So it allows him to have almost scalable fonts when he wants it for each of those images there. Come on down and he's got some images here that again are set to be fluid height and width. And as the width of the image grows taller, the image fills that container. All right, we're gonna end a little short today because I'm not confident I'm not talking to myself. Um, I think site of the day, how did you do that sessions are pretty terrific. So I'm gonna bring them back onto the docket and every few site of the day, uh, every few jam sessions, we'll kind of jump over and just take a look at what's live. There may even be a chance that I'll do this next Wednesday or next, yeah, next Wednesday, since we're cutting this one short a little bit today. All right, people, if you have not done so and you have a terrific site, please submit it to Site of the Day. Here on the Site of the Day page is uh, submit your site. This is how we all learn from each other and I'm hugely appreciative. You'll also get some incredible traffic to any site that you put on Site of the Day. Um, I've heard just great feedback about that. So when you're showcased, it does have that support, uh, that uh, feature on the side. And for us, it allows us to grow and learn. So thank you, everyone. We will see you in the next jam session. My name is Danny Beaumont, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.